I have great pleasure uh, in introducing uh, Dr. Uh, Mary McAuliffe. Uh, uh, Mary is a professional historian. Um, uh, Dr. McAuliffe is a lecturer, assistant professor in gender studies at the University College Dublin, uh, women's studies, which is in the School of Social Policy and Social Justice. Uh, her research interests include social history, Irish women and politics, memory and history, gender and Irish biography, war military history and oral history. Dr. McAuliffe is widely published, author both in book format and also has contributed articles to numerous historical journals, book chapters in historical book publications as well. Our most recent books include Richmond Barracks in 1916, co-author, um, we were here, 77 women of the Easter Rising, and Kerry, 1916, uh, histories and legacies of the Easter Rising, co-author of that. She was president uh, from uh, 211 to 214, and remains a committee member of the Women's History Association of Ireland, and also sits in the National Archives Advisory Committee. She's also a committee member and treasurer of the Irish Association of Professional Historians. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mary McAuliffe. Thank you and uh, apologies for being late, uh, Brian, Brian, Aaron Rod Aaron, uh, signals that draw it up. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today um, to talk to you about uh, the women of 1916 and indeed it's uh, been a long year of commemoration of the women and this is one of the last talks I'll be giving on this particular subject this year so I'm delighted to be here in Drogheda or in Dundalk. <laughs> where am I? <laughs> uh, I, must, I, am nor I am north of, uh, uh, of Dublin when my name gets pronounced like a lip. It's McAuliffe. Down south. <laughs> um, it's a Kerry name. So, yes. so what I want to talk to you about today are the women of 1916, but not the leadership, uh, more looking at the ordinary women who participated in the Easter Rebellion and looking at the causes and reasons and the motivations uh, why these young women. If you look at this image here, this is an image, a photograph taken a couple of months after the Rising uh, in Dublin in 1916. This would have been uh, in the autumn, as you can see from the trees, they're, they're bare. Uh, and it is at a fundraiser for uh, the National Independence, uh, the National, uh, sorry, uh, Women of the National Aid Association, uh, held a meeting in Leeson Street in late 1916. And about 66 women and young uh, girls are in this photograph, the majority of them having uh, been out in 1916, most of them also having spent time in Richmond Barracks, in Kilmainham Jail, some of them indeed in Manchester <coughs> Jail. Uh, and one or two, like Kathleen Lynn, having been deported for their activities uh, during 1916. And what this image often says to me, and I like to start with this image, is that these women, having been through the trauma of a rebellion, having seen bloodshed on the streets of Dublin, were still committed to an idea. And what I want to explore with you today is what was that idea, or those ideas that motivated them? Most of them, as you can see, are young. Um, and people are very surprised at how young these women are. Most of them from the research that has been undertaken uh, in the last few years outside of the leadership cohort are working class girls and young women, them, women most aged between 17 and about 25 when they participate in 1916. So what is motivating these young working class girls and young women uh, to get involved in a, a violent rebellion. At a time when you understand the social, uh, cultural uh, context of where, of where women were positioned in society, uh, as Myrtle was talking about, um, the vote doesn't come until 1918. Most women are confined to the domestic. The discourse of domesticity, the idea of wife and mother, of marriage as the only respectable place um, and position for a woman in life uh, is very dominant. So now you have these young women participating in a violent rebellion. What brings them out? And that's what I want to explore. Are you very good? Perfect. In your shorty, it's at the right 
1913, Countess Markovitch uh, mentioned that there were three great movements which were motivating women uh, during this period in the lead up to 1916. She understood these as being the nationalist, the women's and the labour movements. And I think in order to understand the roots of women's participation in 1916, we have to look at all three of these. Uh, and using these images, from the top you can see the image of Inya and the Heron, a much overlooked organisation. Uh, small, confined mainly to Dublin, um, founded in 1900 by Maud Gaughan, um, but she doesn't remain involved with it in, in it for the longest time. It's really women like Helena Maloney who are the main prime motivators and the main activists within uh, Indian the Heron. And Indian the Heron is a separatist, feminist, militant organization. So 14 years before Common Amman is founded in 1914, we have uh, women, a women-only organization, women-led, women-directed, looking at women's participation in Irish society. And not only are they concerned with the vote, but they are, as Myrtle said, concerned with much uh, wider subjects than that. Child poverty, education, uh, they're very much involved in cultural nationalism, uh, they um, uh, are very uh, engaged with um, uh, putting plays on uh, through a theatrical process called Tableau Vivant in which they use their, uh, I suppose they use the theatre to try and motivate people to nationalism using women like Countess Markovitch who is Joan of Arc or Maud Gaughan, or various other women, constructing this idea of the woman as patriot, patriot as well as the man as patriot. In the second image are the executive of the Irish Women's Franchise League, uh, set up in 1908, a young generation of women who have perhaps lost some patience with the uh, lobbying and more moderate campaigning of the 19th and early 20th century suffrage women. They are now uh, becoming more militant. They're more engaged with politics. Uh, one of their big campaigns that they undertake in this period, of course, is to get women's suffrage included in the 1912 Home Rule Bill. Uh, you have women like Hannah Sheehy Skeffington in this. Uh, mostly it's a middle class women who are still involved in this um, aspect of women's politics in the early 20th century, but it's beginning to broaden out. Uh, Indian the Heron and the Irish Women's Franchise League uh, would have their debates and their discussions and there are tensions between them and I think this is a reflection of the political sophistication of some of these women and their growing confidence in their own politics and their own ideas through the early part of the 20th century. Indian the Heron for example would uh, not really be uh, engaged in activism to gain the vote from what they regarded as a foreign government while the Irish Women's Franchise League had the uh, cause of suffrage first above all else. However, in 1912, Indian the Heron and the Irish Women's Franchise League cooperate to try and persuade the Irish Parliamentary Party and John Redmond to include female suffrage in the 1912 Home Rule Bill. This they don't succeed in doing. And I think we have to look at that as well, that failure of the I Irish Parliamentary Party to agree to include suffrage. You see after 1912, um, a lot of the more political women begin to drift away from the support of constitutional nationalism and the Irish Parliamentary Party and they begin to join an organisation led by Arthur Griffith, of course this being Sinn Féin, which allows women to join on an equal basis and indeed many of the women or some of the women get involved in the, at the executive level, including women like Jenny Wise Power, who are on the executive of Sinn, the Sinn Féin. This of course will have repercussions in 1918, when you have so many of these political women, many of them with a long history of engagement at politics at local level, uh, campaigning, um, going on to stumps, talking about uh, the, the election, campaigning for Sinn Féin candidates, uh, getting the vote out. It's a limited franchise for women, but it has enlarged the franchi uh, franchise to a great degree. So we have to look at coming up to 2018 and the commemoration of uh, that general election and, and the first time women get the vote and how important and how fundamental the women's vote was possibly to the fact that Sinn Féin uh, won so many seats in that general election. And so that failure of the Irish Parliamentary Party to engage fully with suffrage will have repercussions down the line. 
And then the third uh, ideology that Countess Markovic mentions, of course, is uh, the, the labor movement. Uh, and from about 1911, uh, with the setting up of the Irish Women's Workers Union, you have young working class girls beginning to come more and more into the trade union movement. Of course, they have been active in, the, in it before that, certainly uh, influenced by both Connolly and Larkin. Uh, they had been engaged with trade union activism prior to the setting up of the Irish Women's Workers Union, but now they have their own organisations through which uh, the needs, the particular needs of women workers can be looked at and can be campaigned on. And interestingly, in the first uh, meeting of the Irish Women Workers Union, you see uh, the three aspects that Markovich mentions here. Socialism, feminism, nationalism coming together. You have on the, the platform at that inaugural meeting Delia Larkin, who represents obviously the trade union movement, the sister of Jim Larkin, and is the first president of the IWWU. You have Hannah Sheehy Skeffington from the feminist movement representing the Irish Women's Franchise League, and you have Countess Markovich from Indian the Heron at this stage. Markovich, of course, is in many of the organizations, but she's at this stage representing Indian the Heron uh, from the nationalist perspective. All of them talking about the importance and seeing those intersections between nationalism, feminism, and socialism for women. Of course, many of the women also were able to communicate their ideologies, and in uh, in the same way that many of the uh, male organizations had their own papers, like uh, had their own newspapers in which they were able to communicate their ideologies, the women were also writing. And journalist women and women who were contributing to these new newspapers are a very important aspect of how the ideas uh, and the issues that women needed to uh, uh, organize around were being communicated to the broader public in this period. Two of the important newspapers, of course, are Ban the Heron, which was the newspaper of the uh, Indian the Heron, edited by Helena Maloney. Maloney being one of the most important and perhaps underrated women of this period. Um, she said that the Ban the Heron, uh, its expressed aim was to be a woman's paper advocating militancy, Irish separatism, and feminism. But you also find in Ban the Heron issues around women workers, uh, education, various other, the broad aspect uh, that women were engaged with, uh, that Merkel talked about. They were uh, taking part in courts campaigns, they were looking at domestic violence, they were engaged in various other things. It simply wasn't just about the vote or about Irish freedom. There was a broad uh, involvement in many of these political women on various national and local issues that they felt were important both to women but also to communities, to families, uh, ideas around marriage, um, uh, guardianship of children, etc., etc. And then, of course, you had the, the Irish Citizen set up in 1912, which was the newspaper of the Irish Women's Franchise League, and its mastheads reads, for men and women equally the rights of citizenship, and for men and women equally the duties of citizenship. And you can see here that they are engaging in a much broader idea than simply the right to vote. For example, they can and did participate in uh, the 1911 census boycott, a very symbolic uh, part, um, issue around which they campaigned. Because women didn't have the right to vote in 1911, these political women decided that they were not going to uh, uh, carry out the duties of citizenship, i.e. filling in a census form. And of course, that's a highly symbolic act, but they understood that not only were they uh, campaigning for the right to vote, but they were campaigning to be for the right to be full and equal citizens, and all that entailed, including filling out a census form, paying your taxes, contributing to society, etc., etc. They were making the counter arguments to the fact that women shouldn't be full citizens because maybe they wouldn't vote to go to war, or because of their nurturing and caring rules, they weren't able to uh, be rational, non-emotional, participate in the um, public political realm. Uh, so they were making these broader arguments. So we have to see that a lot of these women who were engaged in politics in the early 20th century are highly politicized, uh, complicated, uh, sophisticated thinkers when it comes to uh, their ideas of citizenship, their ideas of full participation, and their ideas of where they want 
women's issues to be uh, to, to go from um, in a much broader way than the right to vote. I think also a place we have to look at where um, that intersection between the middle class women who were campaigning really around the right to vote and, and broader aspects of female citizenship uh, and women who were campaigning for the right of women workers um, is the 1913 lockout of which of course Porig is an expert on so I won't delve too long in that area but one aspect I think that we need to look at in 1913 is the participation of women within um, the activism around the lockout and particularly the participation of women in Liberty Hall where you do see middle class women and working class women beginning to form interconnected relationships beginning to form those as, as Roy Foster has so vividly uh, outlined in his book Vivid Faces these communities, these uh, networks of political people who, who, who are beginning to get in, to know each other but also <laughs> beginning to get to know each other's uh, issues and needs uh, and uh, the motivations behind their uh, political activism from uh, about 1911-1912 onwards. So in 1913 you will have women like Kathleen Lynn, Madeleine French Mullen, Countess Markovich, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, very middle class women, educated. Uh, Kathleen Lynn of course uh, has gone on to university as a doctor as uh, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington is also a graduate. Um, they are middle class, they're upper middle class, but they're very much engaged with, uh, by 1913, an idea of women's rights across a broader spectrum than the middle class right of women to vote. And you also then have in Liberty Hall uh, women who've been engaged in trade union activism, usually younger, less educated than the middle class women, but as politicized. Uh, the women like Rosie Hackett, like Jenny Shanahan, Bridget Davis, uh, Bridget Goff. And I, uh, as I have been doing all this year, I think it's incumbent on us in lots of ways uh, to name these women, because in naming them, we're writing their stories back into history as well. Um, and many of those women who were very much engaged in the 1913 lockout then go on to become part of the, more, the smaller but more radical Irish citizen army. Now, there is a discussion among historians about whether women were in the Irish Citizen Army on a full and equal basis. But I think that is a, a, a bit of an ahistorical discussion to have because we have to look at how the women um, saw themselves at the time, how they saw their participation uh, in um, organisations like the Irish Citizen Army. If you look at what Madeleine French Mullen said of her membership of the Irish Citizen Army, she said, we felt we were accepted on an egalitarian basis. Helena Maloney, who also joins the Irish Citizen Army, uh, said that women and men did everything according to their abilities and that if a man could cook, then he should cook. However, of course, at the time, women's socialization and women's domestic skills were paramount. So mostly you have women doing the uh, nurturing and caring roles within the Irish Citizen Army. There is a women's section within the Citizen Army, but the women themselves see themselves as full and equal members on a par with the men at this time. So I think it's a moot point to have that discussion about whether they were uh, fully equal in 1914 and 1915 and indeed in 1916 when they fought as members of the Irish Citizen Army in the rebellion. And this is a very interesting image I think up here. It is, shows the Irish Citizen Army women training in 1914 and again uh, I want to show how young these women were but also their training with 36 and they're training there with Jack White and Countess Markovich watching over the training of the women. The women also talk about going on route marches with the men. Uh, in the weeks coming up to 1916, they are in Liberty Hall. They're making bandages. Yes, they're uh, uh, training in first aid, but they're also making homemade bombs. Not very successfully, indeed, many of them didn't actually ever go off. But they are participating in getting ready for a military uh, campaign and they are anticipating that they will be involved as combatants in that military campaign. So I think we have to see uh, the participation of women, particularly the young women in the Irish Citizen Army, as women who realize that they are going to go out and fight in a uh, violent uprising uh, for Irish freedom and also for the rights of workers as they continue to believe in their trade union activism. 
Of course, the biggest organization that provides women for uh, the 1916 Rising is Common Amon. And Common Amon is a very interesting organization. Mo most of us think we know Common Amon. But actually, it's quite a complicated organization. And if we look at the foundation of Common Amon in 1914, it's very interesting to see that it was a self-selected group of women who, when they realized that the Irish Volunteers founded in November 1913, uh, were not, uh, the Irish Volunteers were not going to allow women in. So this group of women, supported by some of the leaders of the Irish Volunteers, including Tom Clark, um, between November and April 1914, uh, have a series of meetings in which they decide what they are going to do about women's participation and how women are going to have a platform from which they can participate in nationalism and express their support for the nationalist ideologies um, at that time. So in April, on April the 2nd, 1914, they call a meeting at 4 o'clock in the afternoon in Wynn's Hotel uh, on Abbey Street um, for the setting up of a new organization. It's a very interesting what they do that day. They have, as uh, the person who gives the inaugural speech, um, Agnes O'Farrelly, a professor of Irish at UCD, a member of the Gaelic League, a friend of John Redmond, a, a home ruler, a constitutional nationalist, a very moderate uh, figure, a feminist, a supporter of the right of women's suffrage, uh, but very moderate. So uh, in, in lots of ways what they're doing is they're trying to bring as many women along. The more radical nationalist women, the more militant women, like Jenny Weisbauer, like Kathleen Clark, uh, uh, like the others who are on the executive, don't put themselves forward. Uh, but O'Farrelly delivers the first inaugural address, and in doing so, uh, begins the first argument between the various women who are involved in political activism at this time. In her delivery of the first inaugural address, she talks about the fact that Cumann and Mon were going to uh, campaign for Irish freedom. They were going to set up a Defence of Ireland fund in which they were going to arm a body of men for the fight for Irish freedom. And this was a very sticky point for the feminist women. Uh, there is immediately, through the uh, new letters of the newspapers of the Irish Citizen and various other newspapers, an argument between uh, the, f the feminist women who saw Common Amon as uh, constructing themselves as auxiliaries of the Irish volunteers, of arming a body of men as a retrograde step for women's uh, full citizenship and women's uh, campaign for equal rights. Um, and they called, indeed, they called uh, the Common Amon women all sorts of names slave women, animated collection boxes, etc., etc. However, the Common Amon women were well able to defend themselves, and Mary Collum, who was a member of the Common Amon uh, executive at this time, writes a letter back saying that even if the Irish volunteers disappeared overnight, the Common Amon women would be able to carry the nationalist project forward, that they were uh, dedicated to this. Um, and they saw themselves as allies, as comrades in the nationalist project, not as auxiliaries. This argument continued to rumble on, actually, until the split. And many people don't realize that Common Amon split as uh, violently, in many ways, as uh, the Irish volunteers do over John Redmond's Wooden Bridge speech, in which he calls on uh, the Irish volunteers to go where the fighting line will extend after the war has broken out. And indeed, the split that happens over that almost does for Common Amon. Many of the branches that have been set up almost disappear. In doing my own research uh, in Kerry, for example, the Kerry Common Amon, the Tralee branch of, of Common Amon have a very, very vitriolic meeting after that in which they discuss the fact that the executive Common Amon have rejected Redmond's call, um, but the branch in Tralee are, are Redmondites. So they, of the 20-odd uh, women who are in the branch in Tralee, only three remain post Redmond's speech. However, we can see by early 1915, Common Amon is beginning to revitalize again. And indeed, in Tralee, that branch comes back into being. It springs back into bigger and better by uh, the uh, spring of 1915. And indeed, Jenny Wise Power said that the split in Common Amon cleared the road for the work we had to do. So you can see by the end of 1914 going into 1915, Common Amon is becoming much more militant in its ideology, in its speeches, and also in its uh, 
symbolism in its uniforms, as you can see here from these uniforms and its badge. And it is now signing up for that more militant road with women as allies of the Irish volunteers as they are going on into the future. So these are the women who eventually end up uh, coming together. The young women of the Irish Citizen Army, politicised through trade union activism. The women of the uh, feminist movements earlier on, the women of India and the Heron, who now become a branch of Kumanaman. So feminism, nationalism and trade union activism have brought over the, uh, almost 300 women onto the streets of Dublin on Easter week 1916. About 250 or 60 of them are in Dublin, the rest in Enniscorthy, Ashburn and in Galway. And indeed in various other parts of the country, including in the north, as Myrtle mentioned, you have women standing by, ready to participate, uh, women in branches of Common Amman. In uh, my study of the women in Tralee, uh, they are there in the rink uh, on Easter Friday, uh, waiting for Roger Casement, they don't know at this stage that he has been arrested, along with the Irish volunteers. So all over the country, the Cork coming them on are ready, the women in Limerick are ready, the women are ready in Galway and they do turn out. So all these branches uh, and uh, organisations of women, hundreds of them, more than actually uh, turned out in 1916, were ready and prepared to fight. Uh, in that period. Because, of course, of the confusion and the countermand, we end up with the rising we did have. And what is the reward for this dedication, this politicization? Well, it's written into the Constitution, and the women see that almost immediately. It is, of course, that the Republic it begins with Irish men and Irish women, that claim to Irish women's allegiance. The Irish Republic would be claim the allegiance of every Irish man and Irish woman. It would guarantee religious and civil liberties, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens, etc., uh, etc. Et so it is that, that the new republic, the new imagined republic that would come about if the rising succeeded, which of course we know it didn't, uh, would include, uh, would be a republic in which there was full and equal uh, citizenship for men and women. And indeed, in the proclamation, the words men and women is, is, is repeated quite a few times, three or four times, in the proclamation. Almost immediately, you can see in 1916, during the week indeed, the proclamation is used by the women in order to be able to do uh, or, or participate in a way that they want to participate. Margaret Skinner, uh, who famously now known as the snipers, uh, sniper of Stephen Green, but actually she was never a sniper, um, who was uh, based in the Royal College of Surgeons and wanted to lead an action against a sniper, a uh, British sniper who was based on Harcourt Street. Uh, but Michael Mallon, the commandant there, was uh, anxious not to read, let a woman out, quoted the proclamation back at him. Uh, on, that was on Wednesday of Easter week, 1916. She said, we're on an equality with the men, as promised in the proclamation. I, I, on Easter Friday, in the GPO, when Pierce gathers all the common among women together uh, to tell them that you know they're going to evacuate the GPO and they're going to go out first, uh, they at first dispute him because of what has been promised in the proclamation. Why should they leave when the, uh, their male comrades are going to remain behind and fight their way out of the GPO? In the end, he has to order them out. And of course, what he's saying is, you have work to do subsequently. So that appeases them somewhat, and they do leave, except for three, Winifred Carney, uh, Elizabeth O'Farrell, and Julia Grennan, who are the three women who uh, evacuate the uh, GPO with the men. 77 women are arrested subsequent to the rising. Interestingly, in looking at the arrests, you can see how uh, social mores play out. Uh, many of the British officers who are arresting the women don't quite know what to do with them. Uh, in Marabone Lane, where you have 22 Indian Nahara and Branch uh, of common among women, they have to insist on being arrested. Rose McNamara, their commandant, insisted that they be arrested with the men because they were rebels, the same as the men. And indeed, they weren't uh, disarmed. They actually marched to Richmond Barracks with the guns uh, still on them, and some of the, their male comrades had handed them guns as well. Eventually, uh, they were being held in the married quarters, and apparently they stuffed the guns up the chimney in the room they were being held, hoping to come back and get them at another time. Um, Kathleen Lynn, when she was arrested in City Hall, 
who was initially thought by the British officer to be a doctor who had been brought in off the streets by the citizen army and forced to look after them. And she had to insist that she actually was an officer and a rebel uh, and to be arrested. So many of the women had to insist on their status as insurgents, but not just to the British. One young woman, for example, Catherine Byrne, um, who wanted to participate in the Easter Rising, and indeed her mother told her the Rising was on, go out and do your bit with your brothers, uh, arrived at the GPO on Easter Monday, was told to go home by the young man at the door who knew her, and walked around the corner and kicked in the window and jumped into the GPO. Uh, so these women in many ways had to negotiate, not just with the British, but with their own comrades, their participation in the 1916 Rising. But negotiate their participation they did, and of course famously, uh, one uh, outpost didn't allow the women in in Boland's Mill, but in the rest of them, they all managed to get in, and they all managed to participate. And those 77 women were taken off to jail. They spent about 10 days in Kilmainham jail, and the vast majority of them are, are released around the 9th of May. About 12 of them were taken off to Mount Joy as uh, you know subversives that are too dangerous to be released, including Markovich, Helena Maloney. Nellie Gifford, um, Kathleen Brown, and a few others. And then about six of those are deported to England, including Markovich, of course, who was imprisoned uh, in England. However, <coughs> the women who were released from the 10th of May onwards don't lay down their laurels. And it's this I want to look at in the time. Have I got a few more minutes? Yeah, yeah. I want to look at what do they do afterwards? We have seen the politicization of these women, so what do they do afterwards? Well, I think it's going to be very interesting over the next year. Um, people are saying now 19, uh, 2017 will be a quiet year. But I think actually for women, uh, for people who are studying women's participation in the rising, this is a very interesting year, Bet after the rising up to the election of 1918. Because, of course, this is when the women come into their own as propagandists, uh, as keeping the Republican flame alive, as keeping the ideologies of what motivated men and women to fight 19, the 1916 Rising. So you see them immediately organizing uh, the National Aid Dependence Funds and various other um, um, committees are set up to help the wives, uh, widows and orphans of those who've been executed and the wives and families of those men who are now interned in uh, jails in England and Wales. Um, then they begin to uh, issue memorial cards. What they are doing is they're constructing the mythology of patriotism, the mythology of the signatories, uh, the mythology of the patriot dead. And they're selling that uh, to the populace. And you know, people talk about how by the time the men were released through 1917, the attitude of the people, the general, the broad population had changed from one of disgust at the 1916 rising to one of acceptance and then to one of support. And I think we have to look, and we will see uh, after that, the uh, absolute integral role that women played in changing the hearts and minds of men and women uh, throughout the country. The widows coming out, making speeches, uh, issuing of, of uh, <coughs> propaganda, uh, pamphlets, etc., etc. So that by 1918, and the and, and women getting the vote, you have a whole cohort of politicized women who are used <coughs> to organizing committees, who are used to campaigning, and who now participate in one of the biggest uh, constitutional campaigns that they ever do, or one of the biggest political campaigns they ever do, the second one being anti-conscription, uh, which is campaigning for the 1918 general election. And prior to that, they issue the uh, manifesto, common man issue a new manifesto, and if you recall, I said in their first manifesto, they said they were, they were set up to fight for Irish freedom and to arm a body of men to fight for Irish freedom. Interestingly, in their 1918 manifesto, the very first article, and I think this reflects how common men are developing uh, in their thinking and in their politics, it says that the first aim of common men is to follow the policy of the Republican proclamation by seeing that women take up their proper position in the life of the nation. This is a feminist statement. They want women to gain that full and equal citizenship. And Kovina Bond had never been overtly feminist, although most of the organizers were suffrage campaigners and a long time feminists. Uh, but as I said, in that initial setting up, they quite 
in, in a very sophisticated way, wanted to, to not scare the moderate women. The second one is to develop the suggested military activities in conjunction with the Irish volunteers. So allies, comrades. The third is to continue collecting for the Defence of Ireland Fund and any other fund to be devoted to the arming and equipping of the men and women of Ireland. So you see a sea change happening here in the ideologies of Cumann and Mann. It is now seeing men and women as fighting for Ireland. Um, the 1918 uh, election, of course, is a testing ground for the women. They act as personation agents. They are, well, the 1917 by-election in which Count Plunkett won the seat in Roscommon was actually one of the places where they trained in this sort of political activism. But in 1918, they do turn out. Um, and they pr uh, produce, Common Man produces the pr present duty of Irish women. Irish women, your country calls to you to do your share in restoring her rightful place among the nations. No great sacrifice is asked of you. You have merely to secure the votes to which you're entitled and use them on behalf of Sinn Féin candidates at the next general election. Now, they were very disappointed no more than the more women weren't run as candidates in the campaign. And indeed, as Myrtle said, they didn't really uh, turn out to help Winifred Carney in East Belfast. And it is a miracle she got 300 plus <laughs> votes. Uh, and it would have been so wonderful had she been elected. But they do succeed in having Countess Markovic elected uh, as the first woman to Westminster. And of course, she doesn't take her seat. And then she becomes. Uh, a woman TD in the first soil, and indeed the first woman minister for labour. And an interesting side note, the second woman minister in an Irish parliament <coughs> government is Marie Ger Mara Gagan Quinn. So that indicates uh, perhaps the, uh, the, 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 the what happens subsequently. Common among then become the biggest women's organisation through the War of Independence and into the Civil War. Uh, I won't go into today what the Common Among Women do because we will be looking at that over the coming years in the War of Independence. Uh, but their participation is vital and integral uh, part of that and what they suffer is also something we need, really need to uncover uh, in the next couple of years through research. What they do in the Civil War also is very important. Um, as you can see, um, just one, I, I suppose, comment on that. During the War of Independence, about 50 or 60 women were arrested by the British authorities, mostly for uh, collecting without a proper license. I think there was, a, till about late 1920, there wasn't a real understanding of the contribution of women to the war effort on behalf of the guerrilla army that was fighting uh, in uh, the flying columns in the various parts of Ireland. During the Civil War, about 500 women were arrested and imprisoned, mainly in Kilmainham and the North Dublin Union, but in other jails around the country as well, by the Free State Government. Those were anti-treaty women. That is a reflection of how important they knew the women were to the anti-treaties um, group's capabilities of conducting a war, of conducting a, uh, uh, actions against the Irish Free State. In taking the women out of circulation, you remove the intelligence gatherers, the safe house keepers, the arms dumps keepers. You removed um, those who would be able to, you know, do the set up the first aid stations, etc., etc. You removed a significant part of the ability of the anti-treaty forces' um, capabilities of carrying out a, a successful campaign. What happens then? in the 1920s, just to end up there, because the title of the talk was Promise and Loss. What you see often in post-colonial uh, states, in post-imperial states, is a retrenchment to traditional ideas. And we see this on both sides of the border, north and south, very, very similar. In fact, it's probably the one uniting thing is the attitude to women uh, in north and south of the border once, once the um, partition comes in. W.T. Cosgrave, president of the first executive of the Irish Free State, said that unhappily for Ireland, diehards are women whose ex ecstasies at their extremists can find no outlet, but no outlet to satisfying uh, but, uh, as destruction. I.e., the women who have been blooded through the War of Independence, who have participated, are now not quite women. They're not the type of women we want in this country. The ideology of domesticity and respectability and morality 
uh, and passive femininity begins to raise it head, its head again. Of course informed by a pre-existing conservative uh, culture and the now increasing dominance of Catholic thinking and Catholic social policy particularly. Uh, P.S.O. Hegarty said in 1922 that the hysterical women of Common Amman uh, fermented conflict where men would end it. And he said that women's business in the world is, is the things of life, but these women busy themselves with nothing but the things of death. And then, without reimposing control on the women, it had the potential to destroy society and the Irish nation. This was the ideology that these women needed to be put back in their homes. And you can see that then from uh, 1922 onwards. The Constitution of 1922 is very neutral on gender. It promises full and equal citizenship to men and women, uh, extends the franchise equally to men and women, uh, and uh, we leave it there. So the potential is we now have a state in which women have full and equal citizenship. After that, however, the new terror of the Irish Free State, as said by Mr. Farig O'Malley, women, are now being put back into the home. And as Maria Luddy says, the benchmark by which women's groups measured the performance of various governments with regards to women's rights was a standard rarely met of the governments of their period. And just to give you an idea of what happened between 1922 in terms of politics and 1937, here's a list of various acts that were put out both by the Commonwealth Royal Government and the Fianna Fáil Government, we can't blame either, um, to chip away at women's rights, starting with the Civil Service Amendment Act, which, didn't, uh, which said women couldn't take certain senior civil service exams, therefore would never move up into the upper echelons. And almost 100 years later, that still has effect if you look at our civil service uh, membership. At the lower levels, you have majority of women. At the upper levels, a majority of men. The Juries Act, uh, which said that women shouldn't serve in juries, and then when that was resisted, said that men would be put automatically on jury lists, but women had to opt in, which of course they didn't for the most part, because it wasn't seen as a respectable thing for women to do to opt into jury lists, as one uh, TD said in the Doyle, who's, who would cook the dinners if women were sitting on juries? Um, the Committee of Evil Literature, the Censorship of Publications Act, which pub uh, censored sex education, also information on contraceptives, etc., etc. Conditions of Employment Act in 1935 said any Minister for Labour could decide which job women could and could not uh, work in, where they could and could uh, not be allowed uh, to get jobs in. Uh, and culminating then in Bumrachna here in the Irish Constitution, which positioned women firmly and absolutely within the domestic. Uh, Articles 40.1 and 0.2, uh, a woman by her life in the home gives to the state a common good without which it can't do. And then mother, conflating the term woman and mother because women are mothers uh, and mothers uh, are women, etc., etc. And that's the only role women are allowed to play within this state that mothers should not, by economic necessity, be forced to work outside the home to the neglect of their duties in the home. And that is the phrase. <laughs> that is the phrase. <laughs> of course, those articles are still in our Constitution today. In fact, interestingly, when 19, the 1937 Constitution was being uh, put to the people, there was a real reaction. It's one of the biggest campaigns that many of the women who had fought in 1916 and through the War of Independence and Civil War and had resisted, and, and Merkel has pointed out that while women are pushed out of mainstream politics, there is a real continuation of feminist activism at the local government uh, in areas of uh, social care, education. You have women like uh, Kathleen Lynn and Madeleine French Mullen setting up St. Dalton's Hospital for sick infants, for example. A lot of women campaigning around social housing better education, better health care, etc, etc. So the women are still there, they haven't gone away, uh, but they're doing things outside of the mainstream uh, political level. However, they do start a huge campaign against the 1937 constitution. Old Cumann Amman, the University Graduates Women, the Irish Women Workers Union, all the different organisations that were involved in campaigning for different, uh, different areas for rights for women come together to go against the Constitution. 
and uh, this is one. This was a pamphlet issued by the National University Women's Graduates Association, who called on a vote against the Constitution. Of course, they lost. Um, the Constitution was accepted by the people and has become the Constitution, which we still have to this day. Um, but it reflects that promise, that loss of the promise of 1916, that these women had been had fought for, had campaigned for, would continue to fight for every single one of these 66 women here and thousands others who began to join Cumann Amman afterwards, after 1916, continued to campaign, continued to be active, continued to try and make our society a better place for women and children. Many of them never spoke of their activism again. We lose their stories, or we lost their stories, we're beginning to regain them again. And it is these women that we need to look at to see how Irish society responded to uh, women's rights, how they responded to the construction of the idealized Irish woman and how that impacted on women's lives uh, subsequent to the setting up of the Irish Free State. We have to look at the histories of institutionalization, for example, the histories of Magdalene laundries and mother and baby homes and uh, various other as the dark aspects of our histories like that. But that isn't to say that these women went away and that feminism stops in 1918, or indeed 1922. It doesn't. It continues on and it is revitalized in the 1970s. Um, so part of the commemoration of these women of 1916 throughout this year has been looking at, number one, the themes that came through in the research and uh, the idea that this was a, a, a rising of young working class women as well as middle class women and the politicization of the working class women and the politicization of rural women. But also looking at the post-revolutionary decade, uh, the post-revolutionary activism and the loss of the radical promise, the moment maybe when something could have been different. Uh, and we have to understand why that changed. But also looking at the conversations across a hundred years that have happened in this year, wearing my feminist hat for a moment, uh, the artistic and legacy projects that understanding the participation of women in 1916 have brought up, expanding the conversation about women's history and what women's histories are, not that there is one linear narrative that we all have to understand, but that there are a multitude of narratives, that there were the war women, the women who, the unionist women, the nationalist women, uh, the working class women, the, the ordinary women who just went about their lives and weren't at all politicized that all those histories have to be included in understanding uh, the early 20th century. Uh, the concepts of citizenship and belonging in a post-colonial state, how the women understood citizenship and how they wished to belong, and particularly how those conversations and those understandings and those histories have affected us today as modern Irish women and how we reflect back on 100 years of that. Uh, and we are continuing those reflections in uh, organizations like Waking the Feminists, etc., etc. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Again, uh, I think it was a wonderful insight into uh, the role of women in the early uh, sort of 20th century and their emergence, I think, onto the political front uh, and into the labor movement.